Okay. Been so, doing video calls for a while now, so <laughs> we're getting used to it. <laughs> so true. So um, I guess first, will you introduce yourself, say your name and affiliation for the sake of the recording? Sure, yeah. My name is Justin Boudelier. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Great, thank you. And so, um, with so for the consent, you know, you're invited to participate in this research study about disaster research perspectives on COVID-19. Lisa Ritchie, um, is, who is at Virginia Tech now is our PI and the protocols for the study were approved by the Institutional Review Board at Oklahoma State University and at the University of Kansas. Um, your participation is completely voluntary. There's no penalty should you refuse to participate or should you withdraw your consent at any time. If you do agree to participate in the study, we ask that you do the following things. Um, including this interview, and then we will do one subsequent interview over the next 12 months to follow up on some of your initial comments today. Um, there's no compensation for participating in the study, and unless you request otherwise, the information you give in the study, in this interview, in the next interview, um, will not be anonymous. So this means that your comments will be attributed to you, to your participation in the study, um, involves were similar to researchers' daily activities. Um, and if you have any questions, definitely please reach out to Liesl or feel free to reach back out to me. Um, and so with that, do you agree to participate in the study? Yeah, definitely. Yes. Awesome, thank you. And at this point, we are planning to kind of share the transcript back with the, back with the interviewees too, so that you kind of, you know, just so you have a, a record of that as well. Cool. Um, all right, so I sent this interview guide beforehand, and if you didn't read through it, no worries at all. So I'm just going to step through each question, though. Okay. And the first one is, um, would you please tell me a bit about your professional background? Sure, yeah, so I, um, my undergraduate is in math and statistics. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Toronto in Canada uh, from, oh my gosh, I graduated in 2018, so from like 2013 to 2018. Um, my PhD is in industrial engineering, uh, specifically operations research. That's the area that I work in. Um, and then I did, uh, after my PhD, I uh, accepted the assistant professor job at the University of Wisconsin, but I delayed a year and did a postdoc at MIT on um, humanitarian logistics and disasters. Very nice. Uh, and then I just finished, th this was my first year as an assistant professor, so it was certainly a <laughs> crazy first year. Oh my gosh, I can imagine. Um, yeah, I, I do recall those days. I'm not too far from where I am now. When and how did you get involved with research on disasters? Uh, yeah, so I think, so I guess for some context, all of my PhD work and most of my current work is, is in healthcare mm -hmm. um, and, and particularly in global health. So I have a lot of projects um, in developing countries, low and middle income countries. Uh, so I don't think that really counts as disaster research. Most of it is like, a lot of it is emergency medicine, which is kind of similar in some ways mm -hmm. to disaster research. Um, but I would say like my first exposure to more classic disaster research was during my postdoc. Um, I was working on a project that was funded by the National Academy of Science uh, and Engineering around um, supply chain resiliency following the 2017 hurricane season. So what could we learn from Irma, Maria, and, uh, you know, and Harvey to basically improve supply chain resilience. And we focused a lot on um, like last mile fuel supply chains because fuel is such a big enabler of other systems, right? You need mm -hmm. fuel for generators at hospitals, you need fuel to move trucks which have you know, produce and other goods in them. Um, so that was like, I think my first exposure to disaster work. Very nice. Do you, okay, so the, it, I guess if you were to say, you, if, special, if you specialize in a certain type of disaster research, would you just say that it's more emergency medicine? Yes, exactly, yeah. 
And is there, you mentioned, so during your postdoc, you studied the 2017 hurricane season. Um, and so this question may or may not be exactly applicable, but is there one seminal disaster event for you that really shaped your thinking about disaster research? And, and maybe it was a personal experience before that. Good question. No, I think I think it is probably that that hurricane okay. season. I mean, of, of the hurricanes, if I had to pick one, it would probably be um, or I had stuck between Irma and Harvey because we did a lot of like you know work on those two, and in mm -hmm. particular in Houston and in Miami, Florida. So those are the two that I would say like shape my views. Uh, okay. In terms of like the emergency medicine side of disaster planning. During my PhD, I spent them a month in Bangladesh, in Dhaka. So that mm -hmm. shaped a lot of my views about, I mean, they, they basically the city floods every time it rains. Mm -hmm. so, so that had definitely had some input, but it wasn't like formal disaster research. Okay. Yeah. What, um, what was the focus of your research before COVID-19? So I know you mentioned the National Academy Supply Chain Study as a postdoc. And being, you know, and then coming to Wisconsin. So, did you have any, you know, particular projects you were working on during this first year prior to, say, March 2020? Yeah, I have a bunch of projects. Um, so, most of them are in developing countries. I have a large project in India around diabetes um, and community health workers. So, how can we leverage community health workers to improve screening and management of diabetes, particularly for um, low-income segments of the population who might live in like, slums or hard-to-reach areas? Um, and then I have another project uh, that's also pretty large, which is around tuberculosis uh, in Kenya and sub-Saharan Africa more broadly, so trying to understand um, we're working with like a, a company there and trying to improve adherence to TB medications. So how can we use like behavioral interventions and when should we use behavioral interventions to improve adherence to TB treatment? Mm -hmm. um, I would say those are the two large projects that I'm currently working on. Like I'm still wrapping up some stuff from my PhD work, you know, sure. finishing, finishing papers and all that that are in the review cycle. But those are the two main ones right now. How um, has COVID-19 impacted either of those two studies? Yeah, it definitely has. It, yeah. So it has, uh, it actually has impacted a lot of my other research in that I can't travel. So I had plans to travel to, to India in the winter and then to travel to Africa this summer. Obviously, none of that <laughs> happened. Um, so I think the biggest issue, yeah, is just travel. Like it's unclear when we'll even be able to travel again in the future. So. Uh, mm -hmm. And like the impact of that on the research specifically is it just kind of makes it a bit more difficult to build these relationships with like the local stakeholders. Um, like luckily in both situations, I have great collaborators in those places who've been able to like kind of keep us going and help with data um, remotely. But yeah, it just makes it a bit more harder, uh, a bit more difficult. I'm sad that I couldn't send my PhD student to India this summer. Mm -hmm. I think that would have been a great experience <laughs> for her. Okay. Yeah. Um, so have, have your data collection efforts have to change because of it, or since you have people locally, it's mostly been able to continue? Yeah, it's mostly been able to continue. Um, it's unclear, like I think the timing was such that we had just finished a bunch of data collection and, we, and we're kind of in the anal analyzing phase. Um, so I haven't really had to like cross the bridge of starting a, a new project and thinking through data collection from scratch. I'm not sure. Like, I don't know if that's even possible these days. Um, but yeah, so these were kind of lucky that they weren't you know, hugely impacted. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, and what is the focus of your COVID-19 research? Yes. So I have two COVID projects. Uh, the main one is around PPE supply chains. So uh, this project started in March and it's funded by NSF Rapid. Um, we, we designed a website and an algorithm that matches um, manufacturers of PPE with facilities or organizations who need them. So the, there's a website, it's shield-net.org, uh, and you can go on there and either, if you're a manufacturer, you can input information um, such as like how much you produce per day, lead times, how much it costs, Organizations can put requests in the system, and then we have an algorithm in the back end that does matching. Um, we try to match uh, requests with demand in a fair way, fair meaning 
you know, we're trying to spread around the supply. We're not trying to favor any particular people. We're trying to make matches that are local because we kind of noticed that local matches seem more successful. So it's all around like yeah, PPE procurement, which was a huge issue back in March when this pandemic sort of really started. There was, I'm sure you saw like limited face shields, gloves, masks, and everything basically. Um, mm -hmm. So we had a lot of uh, interest early on. I think we've match somewhere on the order of like two million face shields. Um, this wow. project was birthed out of the Badger Shield um, project from UW. So the Badger Shield was like an open source face shield design that UW came up with in early March. Uh, and then we got involved because the scale just kind of got too large and you know, the number of organizations who wanted them. Uh, yeah, and then we kind of, they went through like a bit of a lull and now it's on the uptick again. <laughs> so it seems that requests are coming back again. Mm -hmm. So that's the main project. In terms of like the research angle, so I think that the project has two angles, right? It's very like sort of we're trying to solve a real problem, but we're also trying to study um, what we're calling these pop-up supply chains. So many, because face shields in particular are a very simple thing to create, it's not like a ventilator or N95 mask, for example, almost mm -hmm. anyone can make them. If you have, mm -hmm. you know, some manufacturing equipment, it could be as simple as like scissors and plastic, but it could be as complicated as large scale like cutters, right, and, and, and manufacturing plants. And so this has kind of caused like a bunch of industries to pivot into this area. And that there's a disconnect because many of the medical facilities or organizations who need them aren't aware because those aren't typical producers of this product. And so that's where like we tried to fill the gap of, you know, many organizations, especially like some of the ones here in Wisconsin, you know, have switched into producing this PPE and they didn't really know how to get like how to connect with hospitals who needed them. So that's kind of what we're trying to study is like how well did this work? Does it have a role in like future disasters or future pandemics? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what what's a successful match? How can we make this more efficient? <laughs> right, I kind of alluded to like it seems that local ones are, are more successful. But we don't really know why yet. Okay, so you mentioned that you had two studies. Is, yeah, the other one has has not actually started yet. We just got funding for it like last week. Um, it's internal at UW. Uh, it's around, so UW has like a current COVID dashboard. So UW Health, I'm speaking of like the medical side of the university and the hospital, they have a dashboard that sort of um, allows them to understand operationally where there are, where they are. So, you know, for example, like the number of beds free and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and we're, it's a collaboration with medical folks to try to use like machine learning techniques to try to basically figure out what metrics we should be looking at um, to forecast like an uptick in cases or to forecast something that's going to affect the operations of UW. Um, so like, for example, you know, if, if we see an uptick in cases, should we expect, you know, a large influx of new patients? Should we clear beds? Uh, do we need to like, you know, do things like that? So yeah, it's, it's kind of vague because it just it hasn't even really started yet. <laughs> um, okay, so then the I guess the goals of that one then is really just to help inform kind of the UW Med Center like in, in real time? Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think we have like, I mean, there's definitely some longer term goals around like we're going to do some testing in one of UW's satellite clinics in northern Wisconsin, which has like a very different population. You know, we in there's hopes that we could turn this into a larger grant in the direction of like sent, of like surveillance, basically like sentinel surveillance, which is in public health. It's this notion of you monitor hospitals for cases. And then if you see sort of something weird in quotes, <laughs> that could suggest an outbreak is coming. They do this in influenza already, but it's not really known how, how we should do this in for COVID-19 or for sort of pandemics that Mm -hmm. They're not really recurring that we don't know that are coming, right? And a lot of it was motivated by my collaborators in emergency medicine because they're the ones who are the, like they see the cases first before anybody else does, right? Before the data gets reported to the CDC or before it gets, you know, put in any system, they're the folks who are seeing the patients come through the door. And so we're trying to leverage that um, mm -hmm. like early warning, basically, trying to build some early warning system. Okay, that's really interesting. I think by the time that the, the, you know, the like county or state data tells them that there's an outbreak, they already know because they've been treating patients for days probably. Like, oh, we've yeah. noticed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, 
Okay, nice. Um, are there any particular concepts or theories um, that are guiding either of these two projects? Yes, definitely. Um, I think so for the pop-up supply chain project, a lot of it is supply chain literature, right? So trying to, like, I think a lot of this builds off of stuff that we already know around, um, like matching problems are pretty well understood in, in our field. Uh, supply chains are also very well understood. I think some of the, so there's a lot of ability to leverage that information and, and the theory that's there and just apply it to this sort of new case. Um, I mean, I have a, so in, in both projects, there's aspects of like machine learning and data science uh, that go into this. Because mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, a lot of data analysis. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. And, and then I guess on the, on the um, UW Health one, right, this idea of sentinel surveillance, which is a, a thing that exists already for influenza. So I think that's kind of been a motivator. It's just can we design one of these uh, surveillance systems for COVID-19 type disaster, sort of adapt some of those uh, theories. Have you applied, I mean, I guess you had talked about in your postdoc, you did the National Academy's project on supply chain resilience. Mm -hmm. So the question is, are there, um, or how, how has this been adapted from any of your prior work? So you definitely had some familiar, familiar uh, some experience with um, supply chains, but otherwise, yeah, definitely. So I think, uh, so I mean, a lot of my prior work does sort of machine learning and this type of data work in general. So I think that's pretty um, comfortable for me. Um, mm -hmm. I think the, the MIT postdoc actually that work has influence on both of these projects. So I think the supply chain one is pretty obvious, uh, mm -hmm. right? I mean, my prior work in healthcare kind of leans into both of them as well. Like I'm familiar with the healthcare space. I understand sort of like how it works and you know, what goes on. Um, and then interestingly, the, one of the approaches we took for understanding the supply chains um, during uh, hurricane season was this like sentinel surveillance thing. So are there, are there components of the supply chain that we could monitor that would tell us that there may be failures coming, right? So if we see a bottleneck or we see some disruptions at like fuel terminals or gas stations, could we use that information to then sort of like infer that something larger is about to happen? So, which kind of fits into that same idea um, for the COVID-19, right? A lot of it is sort of like trying to build these early warning systems. Awesome, yeah, that sounds really cool. What are the primary methods that you're using in your pop-up supply chain project? Sure, so primary methods would be, so optimization. Mm -hmm. So I guess there's many names for that. It's like a core part of operations research. Some people will call it like math programming. Mm -hmm. It, and I know that there's some civil folks that do this, so I'm not sure if you're familiar or not, but. <laughs> I'm familiar with different types of optimization methods and, and took a kind of like a math programming class. Okay, so like them. LPs and IPs and that kind of stuff, right? So, so the matching problem is an integer program. It's a math program. Okay. Um, uh, we're also using like some machine learning in there as well. Are you, what about like how, what kind of, what um, your data, I guess, where are you getting your data? How are you doing data collection or sampling? Yeah, so the data for the code for the ShieldNet project is coming through the website. So there's like intake forms. So when manufacturers or when organizations submit requests or submit their ability to produce, we're collecting a bunch of data about them at that time. So we'll collect like, uh, you know, their scale. So for a medical facility, you know, what type of facility they are, how many staff they have, how many beds they have, their perceived urgency. Um, and then after a match is made, so after a, there's like a pairing, we follow up with them. So we follow up to try to understand, you know, how much was ordered, what was the final price. Oh, sorry for the loud. Um, was a successful match and we get like shipping uh, codes to see the lead, like to see the total shipping time. So that, that side of the data collection is very manual, obviously. <laughs> There's a, you know, a grad student who's working and making phone calls and sending emails. And so you've said that this website has made about 2 million matches at this point. How are you, how are you sharing the website? How have you kind of um, advertised it to get so many users? Yeah, good, good question. So there was a lot, like we did a lot of media push sort of early on when this was happening. So you know, UW helped obviously with their like 
platform and social media and Twitter and various things. Um, we did like some Reddit uh, AMAs and, and engagement. Uh, and then there was like a bunch of news articles and interviews that we did. So some of them came out in like Wired or, or like bigger magazines. Mm -hmm. um, other ones were just like smaller Wisconsin, like the Madison, you know, local papers. Um, one of the collaborators on the project is a good friend of mine who's a professor at UCLA. So that helped a little bit with getting exposure on the West Coast. Um, UCLA's obviously got a huge <laughs> platform. Mm -hmm. But that, that, I think that is, that was and probably still is the biggest challenge around that project. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then what about for your other project? Um, how, what kind of methods are you applying there? I guess, that, well, you haven't started it yet, but what are you planning to apply? Yeah, exactly. I haven't started. That one is going to be much more in like the machine learning data science direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we're hoping, you know, with access to, because we're going to have a large amount of data through the UW system, um, we're probably going to use more advanced like deep learning style techniques and trying to, I mean, part of that project is, you know, we as humans have some notion of what metrics we think are predictive of an incoming, uh, you know, uptick in cases, but we're also hoping to like do some exploratory work and see if we can find things that maybe are not as intuitive and that maybe, you know, we wouldn't have thought of <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so, so quickly. So I think, yeah, that's a combination of sort of this like data mining sort of data exploration. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, I look forward to that one. Yeah. Um, let's see. It says, what sort of adjustments have you had to make to accommodate COVID-19? So if you were, I guess, you know, since these projects are designed around COVID-19, are you still finding challenges, say, um, with your collaborations? Or I, you did mention being able to kind of recruit people to use the website. Can you talk um, a little bit more about any of that? So challenges related to these projects specifically. Um, yeah, I think I think in the first one, I think that that's the biggest one is sort of just like getting the visibility of the project of the of the matching. Um, I mean, we've had challenges with like follow up information for some of the areas. I mean, people in hospitals are so busy, right? It's, and we were we were kind of hoping maybe or yeah, hope, I guess everyone was hoping we were hoping that things might calm down this summer a little bit and that we'd be able to get get through to a lot of them, but that hasn't really happened. I mean, it has happened some places in the U.S., but not not across the board. Uh, so that's been a bit challenging. Um, yeah, I think that those are the main ones. I mean, from a methodological point of view, like nothing that we're doing is too. You know, I would say mm -hmm. like breakthrough or fancy. Um, there was definitely some challenges like early on around just like getting this operational. I mean, we, we sort of like built this in like a week, or 10 days. So that was really hectic, <laughs> uh, but kind of fun as well. I think research is fun when it's moving fast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with any of the lockdown restrictions or changes in institutional public health guidelines, has any of that impacted your study? Not really, no. Um, yeah, I mean, I managed to bring my computer home pretty early in March, mm -hmm. so I've, I've been set up at home, and my collaborators are, are also at home. I think maybe one slight advantage is that, like, because of the style of my work historically, I'm really I'm quite used to working remotely and with working over Skype with people, since a lot of my projects are like on the other side of the world. So I think that's actually been a bit of a advantage on, in some sense that like this has kind of always been part of my research style it's a bit more now but <laughs> yeah i'll say same i i don't have international collaborations as much but i have a lot outside of ku so i've been a zoom user for quite a while right yeah i think it was easier for people like us to kind of just be like okay we already know how to do this we just have to now do it for everything <laughs> <laughs> for everything exactly um, and so the rapid, I guess, or the, the pop-up supply chain project, what's the expected duration of that project? So the expected duration is one year. Um, it could, I suppose, go on longer. I mean, I, it's really hard to say, like, how, you know, how the pandemic will develop. The, the original objective was one year. Um, I think it's possible that we could apply for further funding, you know, 
more theoretically based on what we learn from that project, right? If we learn that there's opportunity to put more thought into how we, you know, do these matchings or how we should you know, try to design this pop-up supply chain, I, I could see more work coming from it, but yeah, for mm -hmm. now, just one year. And then with your second project with um, the UW Med, what's the um, anticipated duration of it? Same. So it's initially a year uh, with the hope that we'll go for like uh, outside external funding afterwards, depending on how it goes. Okay. And um, I know you've mentioned the collaborator on the West Coast for the supply chain project. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that person, are you collaborating with others on that project? Just I know, so it's just, so it's myself, uh, uh, Oyan Sadiq, who's a professor at UCLA, and then uh, one of my PhD students, uh, Rebecca Alcock, she's kind of like the lead. So it's just really the three of us. <laughs> and then for num the second study with UWMed. Yes, yeah, so there's a bunch there's of people. Of yeah, there's a like a large group from the emergency medicine department, from like analytics within UW Health. Mm -hmm. I think that one probably has a team of like eight, eight or ten, I would say. So your um, colleague at UCLA, you said y'all are friends. So have you worked together previously? No, we've never actually worked together. Mm -hmm. We've been friends for a long time, so we were excited to take this opportunity to work together. But no, this will be the first time. Yeah. Nice. And then with the other project and the mini collaborators, are any of those people you've worked with before? Or no, they'll all, all, be, all be new, yeah. All be all new. Be new. I, I knew some of them and we had, again, like had had meetings with some of them and we've, we've sort of been talking about trying to find collaborations, but nothing, mm -hmm. nothing official before. Yeah. Based on what you've said so far, I'm going to add in a little question here. Um, have you, are you familiar with Neary Converge? Neary Converge? No, I don't think so. Okay. So the question is, what role has Converge played in facilitating your research? So it sounds like that would be a none. None, yeah. <laughs> um, the National Science Foundation has this research infrastructure for natural hazards called Neary. And then Neary, through that, has funded a few different infrastructures, and one of them is Converge, and it kind of facilitates multidisciplinary natural hazards research. And so that's who's funding our little working group to do this. Wow, project. that's cool. I think I should probably learn more about this. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, definitely, I think if you want to do more, it's like getting back into the hurricane stuff or other natural hazards research, absolutely. Because, yeah, the whole goal is to yeah, just bring the community of people together. And they also offer a lot of training opportunities and things like that. So, yeah, it's super neat. Cool. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, and so let's see, where are we? Um, I guess that, that's for the most part, those specifics. And now I want to ask, you know, much like everyone else, your day-to-day -day life is probably also affected by the pandemic. Um, what are some of the changes to your personal life that, you know, maybe impacting your professional life or research? Yeah, good question. So I, I guess I might be a bit of an outlier here. I, I have, um, I haven't had a ton of change, I would say, to my personal life. So I don't have kids yet, mm -hmm. um, which means I haven't really had the major disruption you know, with having kids at home. Um, and I'm kind of a homebody to begin with. Obviously, I'm spending much more time at home than I usually am. Uh, but yeah, there hasn't been like huge changes, I would say. Like, obviously, I would you know, the summer I would like to be out doing fun things, but um, yeah, so I, I don't think there's been like a lot of negative impact. If anything, there's been like some positive impact around just like consistency and I mean, I enjoy working from home. I kind of always have. So this, you know, I enjoyed the structure of, of work. Um, you know, not commuting has just like saved some time and I definitely noticed that. <laughs> And also sort of like, I mean, you, you probably know this as well, like switching costs, right? When you switch between meetings or you, when you're at, at the office, you have to go places. There's just like little amounts of time that get lost throughout the day. So mm -hmm. I've sort of noticed that that's been helpful. <laughs> um, yeah, which is probably not the answer most people are going to give. <laughs> I mean, no, I think that's fantastic. Frankly, I think that there's 
a dichotomy, and I would I'm I'm basically in the same situation as you, um, and so right I was already using Zoom a lot. Prefer to be able to work at home. Don't have kids, so that so it's only you could say been a, had a positive impact on my work, except for some of my data collection has been impacted because I have different yeah. subjects. But um, but yeah, so I, but I think that that's uh, the dichotomy of where people are at and where academia will be challenged to, you know, have that equitable measure across people when you've got people, yeah, basically those workloads yeah. shifting at home so much. And right, like I think as you probably see, like I was also kind of lucky that I was able to jump on some of these projects early on. So it's, it's probably in that way helped my research portfolio. I mean, I got a mm -hmm. rapid grant in my first year, which I think is really great. So I think, yeah, I think you're totally right. Like depending on like who you are and the position that you're in, yeah, I could, I could, I could see this being much worse. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. Last question, and we're doing great on time. And so, to date, what have been the consequences, if any, of the Black Lives Matter demonstrations following the killing of George Floyd on you um, and on your research? So, on my research, probably not much. Uh, at least none that I've noticed immediately. Um, on me, I would say nothing really like di directly. Obviously, like I, you know, had spent more time on thinking of this and discussing this with people, and you know, what can we do as researchers? Um, yeah, other than maybe like mental health <laughs> implications of just like the current climate and and where we are, I think that's the negative impact. But like on just like personal. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that's probably it. Yeah, but I think, um, yeah, that's really very real and felt by a lot of people too. Yeah. Yeah, just kind of, yeah, I would say like definitely just a bit more down on things. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the pandemic doesn't help with that. 2020 has yeah. been a, a ride <laughs> so far. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's the last of my questions. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. Um, so yeah, they teamed me up with more of the engineers, and so, cool. <laughs> um, so, so some of the some of them their interviews are lasting like ninety minutes, and I'm like, no, I've got the efficient engineers to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. go through the question. Wow, ninety minutes. Maybe I should have told more stories. <laughs> um, I mean, if there is anything else you'd like to add, um, definitely please feel free to add it. I don't think so. No, I, okay. I don't think so. And if anything comes up, you know, like I, I mentioned in the beginning, I'll reach out sometime over the next year to follow up to see how your projects are going and, and maybe some of the other comments that you shared. Um, in that time or in between that time, if you know, you have anything you'd like to share with me about your work or otherwise, um, please feel free to do so. I wrote down that web address, shields, is it shields.net.org or uh, is it shields.net? Shields yeah, shield dash. Okay. Okay. Um, so then I could kind of check it out and, and yeah, if there's anything else that, you know, you, you think might be helpful to share, that would be fantastic. Sure. I mean, I can share, if it's helpful for you, I can share more details about the other project, like when that gets started. Uh, if it's not helpful, then I don't have to. Um, I think the reason that you got put in, not I think, the reason you got put in our sample was the rapid, but yeah. it's nice to know of, the, of both projects. And so when I do follow up with you in a year, I'll ask you, yeah, um, you know, if the goals of that project have changed. You gave me a little bit about the methods that you plan to apply. So have you had to make any changes to that, you know, since you got started. And, and um, of course, like you were talking about, we have no idea what will happen with COVID. It would be fantastic if the pandemic's over by the time I talk to you again. So yeah, then, you know, if we have that really nice outcome, then how did that impact your research or, you know, so forth. So, yeah. or the opposite, which hopefully won't. I guess one thing I didn't mention, like on the personal note, is so I'm a, I'm a Canadian, mm -hmm. and the border's been closed. So I, we actually um, we had plans to like go visit family this summer, which was I mm -hmm. think that's probably one of the main disruptions. Just like unable to go home. 
Um, basically, yeah. we can't leave the can't leave the country because it's unclear if we could get back in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and I don't. Yeah. I don't know. There's a lot of countries, I think Canada including, that won't let U.S. residents come to correct. them because correct. they're doing so terrible. It's also, um, I think that's been hard, like observing Canada doing so well, like and seeing all my friends back home, like returning to normal now this summer and still sort of being stuck here in kind of this weird limbo mm -hmm. state. That's been a bit hard. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind me asking, what have you, you know, how are you coping with that? Yeah, so I mean, we do like, again, I'm used to like video chatting with my parents and even my grandparents have like, like they text me and stuff. So I think that's been instilled because like I said, we've always sort of been traveling and been away from home. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty athletic, like active. I, I was a former college athlete. So I, I've like spent a ton more time just like cycling and running and trying to get outside and be active just for like mental health. And uh, so I think that's probably the main way that I cope with. I think that's just my style though. That's how I always cope with things is just be active. And that's why I think we've been fortunate that at least it's been warm enough weather to do some of that. Yeah, I'm a little worried about the winter. We've, I've been, I mean, we got kayaks. So I live in Madison, which has a lot of lakes. So we bought some kayaks this summer to like explore. But I was speaking with my wife, like the winter, if this is bad during winter, will be really hard, I think. Because mm -hmm. like, it's hard to be outside in Wisconsin in the winter and enjoy yourself. <laughs> so we'll have to get creative, I think. Definitely. Well, um, I guess I'll be thinking about you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah. I hope it goes as well as it can. Basically. How how are things in Kansas? Like, where where is University of Kansas? Um, we're in Lawrence, Kansas, which is um about mid or it's about central, I guess, north to southwest, but really very close to the Missouri border. So okay. 35 minutes from Kansas City. Um, 35 to 55 minutes, depending on where, which side, what you're going to. Um, in Lawrence, it's, and so it's about 80,000 people, and the university is 25,000, and so um, KU was really good, and even Kansas was really good back in March. Um, Kansas was the first state to close K-12 schools. And I think that made a huge difference. And then um, KU was on spring break when cases started showing up more around the country. And so they extended their spring break and then didn't return to campus. And so I think it was both of those two actions that we had really low counts through May, um, like not even exceeding 100. Um, and had only have ever had, I think, two in the hospital at any given time. And, and that's even across the whole county in Douglas County, not just Lawrence. Um, but then in June, they relaxed some of the restrictions. They opened the bars back up and immediately we saw a spike. And <laughs> Same so, happened here. Yeah. And so um, active cases, we're a little over 200 right now, but we've had over 400 cases. So that just <laughs> yeah. went. And so now we've closed a lot of things back down. But um, and so, you know, the hospital still, I think, maybe had four at one point, but maybe even it was never actually four. I can't remember if it, if it might have only still been two at the hospital. So still managed to keep things really low, but it's definitely created some um, different expectations and, and paths of thinking about K through 12 school return, KU's return to campus and things like that, because we got a little teaser of what that's probably going to look like. Yeah, um, I think a lot of college towns saw the same thing happen, right? They opened the bars and everybody kind of went out and then there was this huge like two week uptick. Yep. Yeah, is it coming down now? Like we're ours is on the down decline again, sort of after that. It is coming down, and so that's where yeah, it is coming back down. Um, and I haven't checked. It's probably been a week since I've checked the case count um, to know exactly where it is. Because over a week, I think it can change pretty significantly. Yeah. Um, so, but it but it was coming down, and so yeah, and so they've Lawrence has 
isn't going to start in person K through 12 till after Labor Day, so they've delayed that about two or so weeks, and they just kind of made that decision this week. KU is doing a hybrid, you know, to so some on in person, some online in the fall. So, anyways, we'll see. We'll see how it did. We've got a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, till KU starts back, and about four or five till the K through 12 schools start back. So we'll see where we are, I guess. Yeah. I'm hopeful, but yeah. I'm also going to be online teaching in the fall, so I'm hopeful from a distance. Did you do online in the spring as well? I switched to online. Like halfway, yeah, same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I don't really love online teaching. Mm -hmm. I enjoy like being there in front of the class. It's harder online. Definitely, I would agree. The research at home is great. Teaching at home is that's I mean, it, it's fine, but right, as far as like feeling like you're an excellent teacher or you've got that connection with the, the student. connection, yeah. Yeah. Because it's hard to do video with a larger class and you sort of feel like you're just like teaching it to a wall, right? Mm -hmm. but, yeah, you don't get that feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it was, I did pre recorded lectures and just had six grad students in the spring. Um, and so we'll do real time or like, yeah, real-time Zoom lectures with about 45 students in the fall. So it'll, it'll kind of, it'll be a very yeah. different yeah. situation, but I am imagining how that engagement is going to change. Yeah, it's tricky. I found, I use Slack, you know Slack? Mm -hmm. I use Slack for my class, which I found was really helpful just to like get more engagement with those students. It, it, it seems like a lot, especially undergrads are like nervous to email for some weird reason, mm -hmm. but much less nervous to send a chat on Slack. <laughs> so that was somewhat helpful. Okay, that's a good tip. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, I use Slack in my research, and I definitely think you're right that the undergrads in my research tend to go that way, and my grad students will email me. Yeah, so but I, 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 was, I think we have very similar styles because I was also using it recently. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Cool. All right, well, yeah, I'll let you go. But thank you so much, Justin, for your time, and good luck with the projects and, and everything. And, um, and yeah, I'll be in touch. Yeah, good, good luck with the study. Let me know if you need anything from me. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, bye.